Investing in China. Now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. China's contribution to global growth has never been more important, which is pushing companies to increase their operations in the mainland, both through organic growth and acquisitions. This is certainly true for the world's advertising and media companies like Publicis, WPP, Omnicom, Interpublic, and Dentsu, which are scouring China for local agencies, particularly in digital marketing. This week on Thoughtful China, we're getting an inside look at China's M&A environment from Nick Waters, CEO Asia Pacific at Aegis Media. Aegis has made major investments in China this year, including the digital agency Beijing Catchstone Advertising, the technology and digital marketing company Beijing Adset Technology, and the search marketing company Pingzong, known as Pizum. And in a surprise announcement in mid-November, Aegis announced the acquisition of OMP, an online marketing agency, now one of its biggest deals to date in China. So Nick, clearly this is a big deal for Aegis in China. Tell us how the acquisitions came about. Well, all of them have slightly different origins, really, but it uh, came about, uh, all of them came about because we felt we needed to increase our presence here in China. So through the course of 2011, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at the market. We spent a lot of time meeting uh, different agencies, different opportunities. Um, and uh, I guess we uh, distilled down a short list of priority companies that uh, we preferred and who are interested in working with us. So each of them has a slightly different origins, but um, they come from the strategic point of view that we needed to increase our presence here in China. And so can you tell us about the numbers involved in these deals? How big are, are we talking about? Well, there is one of those deals, um, the financial information has been made public uh, in a release to the London Stock Exchange, and that was Catchstone. Um, that was a certain size which, uh, as a publicly listed company in London, we needed to uh, announce the financial details. So I can tell you that the um, consideration for Catchstone, uh, the initial consideration was £55 million. Um, and depending on how the business performs over the next four years, um, could rise to 100 to £150 million. Um, so that's a, a, a large and sizable uh, transaction, as you can imagine. The other ones, uh, the financial information is not in the public domain, so they're not of that scale. Um, but they're all substantial and they rep re you know, represent significant investment for us into this market. So can you give us a little bit of an insight into that process that you just mentioned? When you're looking at these deals, is one of the sort of attractive factors, that, you know, the fact that these agencies are at perhaps a smaller stage uh, in this market and you see that as an opportunity, investment opportunity to get in now uh, rather than a couple of years down the line? Well, I think um, there's a practical consideration that uh, there are very few large assets uh, in China uh, in the agency sector to buy. Um, very few, actually. Uh, we, we made an investment uh, in 2010 into one of the rare large assets, that's Charm Communications Incorporated, taking an equity stake in that business. Um, there's not many other assets of that scale. Um, Catchstone would be one of the larger ones still available. Um, there's still plenty of other assets available, but not, not of that scale. Um, we obviously have a long-term view on the China market. Uh, we think this market will continue to grow uh, strongly for, for many years to come. Um, and within that, we think the digital sector has the uh, fastest and the, and the largest growth opportunity. So these assets might not be huge at this stage, but um, we have every hope that they become so. And you've made four major acquisitions in China over the past year. Give us a sense of how that compares to the other Asian markets that you oversee. Our focus this year and for the last 12 to 18 months has been on China. Um, we have been active in other markets, uh, in India, uh, in Singapore, even in Japan uh, and Indonesia. Um, but our, our focus of, of effort and where we've deployed our resources ha has been primarily focused on China. Um, and will continue to be so, I think, for, for the next 12 to 24 months, even though we, we do keep an eye on other opportunities across the region. Can you tell us about some of the biggest challenges in terms of identifying local companies that are worth buying? Do you work a lot with outside consultants that are based here, or do you work mostly with your local team, you know, members like Gene Lin and Seth Grossman, who've already been on our show as well? We work mostly with our internal team. So our operational leaders, people like Gene um, and Seth that you mentioned, um, are instrumental really in identifying 
businesses and business leaders um, that they feel would represent a good fit for our company and people that we would want to work with. Um, so that's kind of how we, how we find the opportunities. And then once we have found the opportunities, again, it's very much an internal team. We've got a very strong M&A internal team of lawyers and financial specialists. Um, we do uh, use external advisors, and we do sometimes use external consultants, but most, most of the work's done by our own team. There's always a lot of talk about culture fit, mm. and especially when you're talking about uh, cross-cultural acquisitions, mm. international companies, local companies. How different are the cultures of these Chinese agencies that you're purchasing in comparison to other agencies in different Asian markets? I think the cultural fit is the most challenging aspect, the most uh, complex aspect. Obviously, doing business here in China um, requires certain uh, approaches, certain styles. Um, as it does in all individual markets, um, but uh, a Chinese entrepreneur building their own business has a very different approach typically to international companies. So it's important to us that um, we feel that entrepreneur, that businessman um, can um, assimilate and become part of our group, but at the same time we don't want to um, put a blanket of processes and protocols on them that they'll feel straitjacketed about. So what we want to do is bring in the entrepreneur um, who we feel would be comfortable with an organization, but give them the freedom to, to do what they do well, which is uh, build business and create value. Um, in that respect, it, it's not greatly different from other countries, um, but of course there are cultural differences in, in every market. But interestingly enough, I want to share with you something I read recently on China Law Blog, a great blog written by Harrison Moore, a lawyer, uh, and China expert Steve Dickinson. In the article, he talks about how this cultural sort of gap, if you will, um, between perhaps how some Chinese entrepreneurs um, build and, and treat their companies here and also look at foreign investment yeah. sometimes leads to cases where uh, the Chinese companies will take a foreign investment um, but treat it really more as a loan and not necessarily as a partnership, which is a concept that I think uh, in the West is something that we almost take for granted when we're talking about these types of deals. Um, how do you see you know, those types of deals in China um, you know, as, they, as the market opens up and more and more companies invest here? Do you think this is going to become a problem that's going to come to light, or do you think that it's something that's limited to really specific cases? Well, I, I think um, the situation you, you described is, is a reality. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's like a, a problem that's going to come to light. I think uh, it, it exists, and, and uh, we can observe across industry sectors, not just our industry, but other industry sectors, um, situations where that appears to be the case. Um, and that's obviously one of the watch outs for investing in China. Are you able to build uh, a true partnership and create value together? Or is there a danger that um, you know, you're going to have a divergent um, set of objectives? And, and we pay very close attention through the diligence process and through the relationship building process of trying to understand what the objectives of the business owner and the entrepreneur are, and making sure they're similar to ours and quite closely aligned. Um, now, you can't be 100% sure, and nothing's watertight, um, but I think, um, I think you've got to do your best to understand what the ambitions and the objectives of the business owners are. Right, and that is, is great and works up to the point of the acquisition. Is there anything that you've learned from your experience uh, working in China and in this market and working through these deals where you have to apply a specific strategy or tactic to you know, sort of actually make that work in the long run? Because these are long-term partnerships and I'm sure long-term uh, long investments. They are. We're, we're in the business of creating sustainable, profitable growth and creating value here in China. So we do view them all as, as long-term partnerships and long-term investments. Um, do we apply uh, uh, a set of tactics or strategies? I, I don't think there's a uh, simple playbook. I think uh, every business is different. Uh, there are variations on every business model and every person is different. Um, and the business owner and the entrepreneur have different personalities, different characteristics, and indeed different ambitions and objectives. So I think we have to have a very flexible approach to that. I don't think we can come in and uh, say, right, we've got a set of plays, you know, a playbook 
to deploy against uh, against it. There's I think no magic China flavor. I, I don't think so. I think you have to be very flexible, very flexible, and you have to really work out uh, the best approach on a case by case basis. Uh, there are clearly some th some some points in in uh, the process where you feel less comfortable and less confident, and then you have to take a decision whether to walk away. So earlier this year, uh, the Japanese advertising giant Dentsu mm. agreed to buy. Ages, that puts you in a very interesting position in mm. being an M&A on both sides. Yeah. Tell us about how that affects or if it has affected the way that you look at the subsequent acquisitions sure. of other agencies uh, in China. Sure. Well, I think the first thing to say to that is, th is the Dentsu acquisition of Aegis is not yet completed. It's still going through the regulatory approval process. Um, we anticipate it'll be closed um, early in the first quarter of next year. Um, so. Everything I say is slightly speculative because the deal hasn't closed. Um, but what we see in our discussions with Dentsu to date is that they uh, clearly they're buying our company for geographical footprint diversification of revenue streams. Um, but they also um, talk very positively about our strategy, uh, about um, our agency brands, about our client base, about our people, and about our management. Um, and all the indications are that they want to use their strength and power to accelerate our strategy and to strengthen and enhance uh, everything we're doing at the moment. So um, our expectation, albeit before the deal closes, our expectation is that um, the denser acquisition will accelerate um, the strategy, including in the M&A space. Given your track record, you seem to have a good handle on China. but. Obviously, at the same time, you've seen a lot of your competitors um, deploying some of the same uh, acquisition mm -hmm. approaches. What are some of the things that you think foreign companies do wrong when they're purchasing local companies in China? Well, um, I, I, an observation I would make is that um, some foreign companies um, uh, feel uh, investing in China is a one-way bet. You know, the, the, the expectation of, of growth is uh, almost a given. Uh, and I think that's a danger, that's a risk. This is a, a, an incredibly complicated market to do business in. And yes, the economy has been growing strongly and consistently for many years, as has the advertising market. But uh, it is a difficult and complicated business for, for foreign uh, companies to, to succeed in. So I think assuming it's a one-way bet is, is a mistake, and, and that's perhaps a mistake that some companies have made in the past. I think uh, another observation I'd make specific to our industry is that um, there's been such a scramble to acquire assets in China that I feel that um, sometimes the target companies are viewed um, a little bit as a commodity something just to acquire and, uh, and, and push the, push the uh, money to the bottom line, rather than necessarily um, an asset to nurture uh, and to try and create value jointly together. And do you think part of this is also because as more and more large entities are moving into this space, that acquisitions is really in some cases a symbol to investors, to their investors, to say, look, we're in China, we're here now, we're establishing ourselves in all of these sectors here in China through this acquisition, but not really fully integrating them into the business for the long run. I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, I, I think we're all very, very widely aware that uh, Western economies are in a period of uh, some considerable challenge. Uh, Europe, I think, will have um, many years of, of, of ongoing problems and low growth. North America, I, I think, has a more optimistic future, but the recovery has been weaker than uh, many people hoped for and expected. So that, I think, has increased um, the focus on China for growth, including in the acquisition space. Uh, investors are looking to companies to um, make greater progress quicker uh, in China. Or at least appear to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's some truth to that. Mm. Great. Nick, thanks for being on Thoughtful China. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Tudo and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. We'll see you again.